First of all, uh, really want to thank uh, Dr. Jones for, for agreeing to come on. I know it's late there in Scotland, um, so really appreciate the time. But um, uh, uh, Professor Jones is a, is a, a professor of English uh, literature at St. Andrews, which is a very, very notable, I think it's one of like Oxford of... Uh, of Scotland, isn't it? It's, it's, it's considered one of the great universities of, uh, of Oxford and the, uh, the British Isles take the English language very seriously. So it's hard to get a position, uh, of, of that stature, uh, without being a very formidable scholar of the English language. And I think that is very well proven in this extraordinary edition, which is not just an, uh, an edited edition, but really, uh, an amazing, um, I think, um, just an amazing presentation of the work. Uh, I learned a lot of things. I've loved Pope for a long time, and there were lines from this and also from some of his, the Dunciad and other things that I actually memorized many, many years ago uh, and have quoted for people that, you know, have heard me. I've, I've quoted uh, Pope. In, in public lectures, uh, but uh, this rereading re, re some of these things just, uh, I think it was Ezra Pound just said that a book at 50 is is not the same book that you read when you were 20 or something like that. So the, these books are wasted on young people uh, who still read them in college because they're just, there's so much richness uh, in this. So I just, for me, I have to say, uh, you know, without, um, and, and this is not flattery in any sense, but I, I have to say this is really one of the finest pieces of modern scholarship that I've read. Um, and and I just think it's a amazing work. So I'm going to, uh, there, there's some of the passages that I'd like to go over. But before we do that, what, what I'd like to say, one of the things that I was curious about was... Um, the introduction did not have a lot of biographical data on uh, Alexander Pope, and he has such a fa fascinating biography because he was um, from a persecuted sect in England, wasn't permitted to go to school, really, and and became this extraordinary autodidact uh, with just a vast erudition. And, um, and, I, and I think you really did him justice by... Uh, you know, the level of erudition that you present in the annotations and in the introduction. So I'm just curious, um, maybe just a little biographical uh, data and how you feel that influences him as an author. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Pope, Pope was, a, was a, born into a Catholic family um, in, in, the, in the 1680s in, in England. Um, and uh, as he was growing up, Catholics were excluded from various areas of public life. They were excluded from the public schools, from the universities, and, and from participation um, in government as well. And um, Pope, like many others, was um, very antagonistic towards the um, new, new um, dynastic regime, the regime of, of William III that came in in, in 1689. By many in, in um, England hailed as the, as the start of... Uh, well, Brought about an English an English revolution, uh, uh, the foundation of a, of a balanced constitution um, in, in in Britain, uh, and, and by many celebrated as a, as a wonderful period in in British history. But for Catholics, thought of as a time of, of repression by uh, uh, an aggressively Protestant um, king who who also went to war uh, in Ireland, which has a majority Catholic population and and, and was quite oppressive. So, in in his early days, he experienced. Or, or felt that that England was maybe not uh, uh, necessarily a, a very very welcoming place for for people of his of his sect, um, and, and felt perhaps slightly oppressed. and And many have argued that Pope um, was um, keen in theory, if not necessarily in practice, on in restoring the the other um, royal line, the the line of the House of Stuart, which was a, a Scottish um, royal family that had had, had ruled um, Britain uh, previously. Um, so his father was a, a cloth merchant, um, uh, so he comes from a, a kind of trading background, a, 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 a modest, financially modest background. Um, 
but he, he, he uh, his father was a successful merchant and he, he moves out to um, the countryside to the west of London and meets um, older men, uh, aristocratic men, um, uh, literary men, uh, and is very early in his life um, brought into a world of, of, of quite intense um, literary study and, and scholarship. And one, one other thing that marked Pope's early life, he said, was that um, one of his earliest forms of reading was um, reading the religious co controversies between Protestants and Catholics, um, that his father had a, a great deal of this pamphlet literature in his, in his personal library, and, and Pope digested that when he was very young. So I think, um, although, and this is something we might may talk about later, Pope's religious consciousness isn't always front and centre of his writing. Even in this poem, his great ethical poem, he doesn't always come across as a strikingly religious figure or a, a, a figure whose religion is very strongly committed to a particular sect of Christianity. Nonetheless, when he was young, he really um, imbibed um, that, that sense of religious controversy. Um, he had a period um, up until about 1714 when Queen Anne was on the throne, when I think Pope felt very much at the centre of, of British life of British politics. He had a group of literary friends, very famous writers like Jonathan Swift um, as well. Uh, and at, at that moment, I think Pope felt very central. But following the death of, of Queen Anne and, and a change in, in, in the politics, again, Pope started to feel a bit more excluded. So he, his, his mature writings, many of his mature writings from the 17 teens onwards um, to the end of his life in 1744, are, are slightly written from the outside. So he, he, he takes a, a satirical attitude towards um, the, the, the mainstream culture of his day and is, is quite a critic of, of manners, of politics, um, of literary culture more general, generally. Maybe that's enough on, on, as a starter on Pope's background. I think it's also fascinating that he, you know, he suffered from Pott's disease. So he had this horrible scoliosis and, and I think apparently he was about four foot six, which probably would have been quite just difficult and and then being a great satirist uh and mocking so many people i guess he created so many enemies so he's he there's definitely a rebellious mm -hmm. uh, streak in him um so I, you know i just thought of just the mentality of somebody who is an oppressed minority and and kind of a little bit lashing out at the uh the the dominant culture and pedantry obviously was one of his great um, you know, just really uh, set his sights on the pedants of his of his time, and and there was a great deal of that, I think, in the uh, in the in the English uh, tradition. So I I just thought that was really fascinating about him. One of the things um, that I wanted to ask you, um, because what's fascinating to me about uh, an essay on man is, um, and we and I followed it up. With, uh, after Marcus Aurelius, for obvious reasons, um, it, it's it's to me the Christianity is so in the background if it's almost there at all, and I and I know he was criticized for that uh, during his life. I mean, a lot of uh, some of the more staunch uh, theologians, uh, you know, deem this actually kind of a dangerous book almost. But what 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 fascinates me is it resonates almost perfectly with uh for muslims uh just in terms of of his uh his his views on certain things that, and and almost quranic to be honest with you i mean there's some and i'll, and I'll get into that where um where uh, so i'm i'm just uh you know fascinated by what you think just as somebody who's so steeped in him just as a religious quote unquote religious writer because you know, I'm just wondering, yeah, what your thoughts are on that. I, I think this is a, this is a very interesting question. I, I would I'd be extremely interested to hear from from Yushek Humza and, and from the, the rest of the group um, where those where those moments are, what the what the possible kind of Quranic um, echoes might might be. Um, I, I think Pope is certainly a, a believer. Um, I think he does believe in one God. Um, some passages of the poem suggest that he might, either he didn't express himself clearly or that he might have entertained the idea that God was not completely distinct from the created universe, but, but maybe within the created universe. And I think that's one of the, 
the, the more controversial ideas that, that, that God was the, the soul of the world, a, a, a great Stoic idea. Maybe Pope didn't distance himself quite enough from that idea to satisfy his Christian um, uh, contemporaries. Um, I think he certainly believes in the providential universe, and I think that's that's, to my mind, really the the the, the central um, concern of the essay on man is to is to just to demonstrate the um, the, the goodness of God's providence. Um, Pope is, uh, I mean, one of the one of the things that characterizes earlier 18th century Britain is an intense fear of um, the social disorder that can follow from sectarian divide because there was a civil war in the middle of the 17th century and people were keen to avoid the severity of religious conflict that, that could issue in civil war. Right. So there tended to be, for, perhaps for, for, social, for reasons of social cohesion, a tendency to emphasize those points of religion held in common. Right. Which, which can lead towards a very, um, the, the group of people are called latitudinarians. So right, latitudinarian. Don't mention too much about the differences between religious sects or even even the great world religions, but just it just emphasises those points that everything ha everybody has in common. That again leads to an emphasis on natural religion, the religion that can be derived from observing the world around us, that doesn't rely on a particular scriptural revelation and so on. Um, I think one um, one tiny moment in, in in Pope's poem where he 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 comes across perhaps as as, as Catholic. I don't think there are very very many moments um, uh, in in the poem at, at all of this kind. Um, is in the, the third epistle of the poem uh, uh, around line lines two hundred and twenty five to thirty, where he says there are two ways that people identify God. One is through natural religion, through, through observing the world around them and. and deducing that it must be the work of a, of a creator, of a benevolent creator. And the other way is through unbroken tradition, right. so handing down traditions from father to son. So it's not the same as a, as a, as a scriptural revelation necessary, but talks to the, to the importance of inherited tradition in the Catholic Church, as opposed to the inner light of the, of the, of the Protestant Church. So I think in very few moments in the poem, one can get a sense of Pope's Christianity and even of his Catholicism. But I, I agree one has to look quite hard sometimes to, to, to find it there. Well, it's interesting because he, uh, you know, apparently he 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 had a, a longstanding correspondence with Lady Montague. And uh, in there, he says in one of his letters that he was familiar with Islam because she she was actually enamored of a lot of the aspects of uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And and, you know, even though it's a, a later um, Locke was heavily influenced. Um, there, there was a very interesting uh, Oxford Don Edward Pocock. Are you familiar with him? Uh, uh, very, at a great distance, but I know. I yeah, know so they actually know. have the Pocock Library there. But he had studied in, um, he had studied in in Aleppo, Syria, and spent several years there. He was actually originally, I think, a missionary, but. He, he brought back a massive uh, Arabic library manuscripts um, and translated some of them. Henry Stubb uh, at that time was also writing um, Coleridge, you know, they and then uh, there was a very interesting uh, in 1734. There was a very interesting uh, trans. It's the first real translation of the Quran. I mean, there's earlier ones. Um, uh, from the 16th century, but the, the the first decent one was in 1734. Um, so he he wrote this in se around 1734, didn't he? 1735, 1733 to four. That were, yes, so it's it's coming out at exactly that time. Yeah. yeah. So so George Sale's Quran, which was the first translation I read, oddly, um, and I actually have an original edition of it in my library. Uh, but uh, it's actually a really excellent. And I'm convinced that's where Coleridge got the ancient rhyme of the ancient mariner idea of the albatross, mm -hmm. because Coleridge was influenced by Islam and mm -hmm. uh, had read uh, Sales' um, translation. And and Sales has a footnote on, there's a verse in the 17th chapter of the Quran that we put an albatross around the the uh the neck of the sins of people you know on the day of judgment will be like an albatross around their necks um and uh and that's what uh sale says in the footnote that this literally means a bird um 
so uh but anyway he um he, I, I found only one, uh, there's a, 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 an article that I found on Gale, uh, academic article from uh, two English professors at the University of uh, uh, Bin Talal in Jordan called Intertextual Reflections on Nature and Solitude in An Alexander Pope's Ode on Solitude, an Islamic Perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting, I, I wasn't, I wasn't terribly convinced by the argument, uh, because Pope wrote the ode to silence when he was like 12, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I doubt that he, you know, I mean, they're making an argument that he was influenced by the Quran in that thing. And it, it wasn't very convincing to me, but um, I, I do feel that, you know, there was such a huge influence at that time of Unitarianism. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a lot of, um, very interesting ideas about religion beginning to come up with the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I, I do think that, you know, I, I'm pretty convinced that he must've had some exposure. And, and I think it's, it's one of those areas that would be interesting to study. Um, There's, one, if, I'm, if I may just mention one, one text, which is a, a text that I have looked at a, a long time in the past, but I don't, I don't recall it well, I'm afraid, but, um, uh, a man called Samuel Ockley uh, in 1708 translated a work by Abu Bakr ibn al-Tufail. Um, yeah, and I think Pope read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He a copy of it, and and um, from 1708, and, and, and that, so it suggests that he could he could well have read that book. And yeah, and, no, I think and he did read mind it. when he was. Yeah, because that's very much in line with the idea that people come to God through nature. Because that, that's essentially the argument in that. We actually read that book at the college here. The students are, do read that in one of the... We have a cohort system, so they, they all read. It's a great books college. So they all read the same books, which is uh, not that popular anymore. Um, you know, there was something that really struck me uh, in, in your introduction. I just thought it was... It's, um, it was just such a fascinating... Uh, I hope I can find it here. It was the uh, it was a, I think a quote from Pascal about um, hierarchy in the world, um, and uh, he he talks about the two carriages coming to the crossroad. Uh, yeah, here it is. I, I it's on page. Um, uh, page uh it's uh roman numeral um 80 uh so he he basically um he says that uh i mean you say here uh in order in the poem was discussed above in epistle four order means social distinction a rank ordering of people that will produce order as equality indirectly through hope and fear Pope holds the view that equality in the distribution of goods would lead to conflict, but fortune's gifts, if each alike possessed, and each were equal, must not all contest. Such attitudes may well be responding to Thomas Hobbes' assertion of the fundamental equality of all people, and therefore the necessity of conflict. From this equality of ability ariseth equality of hope in the attaining of our ends, and therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. And in, in the way to their end, which is principally their own conservation, sometimes their uh, delectation only, uh, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. Hobbes is a believer in a fundamental equality, the conflictual consequences of which are prevented only by social compact. Pope's sympathies are in a different direction. This, this was what was so fascinating to me. There is a struck through note in the shoulder of the manuscript page on which a version of a couplet just cited occurs, which reads C, uh, peace, Pascal. Uh, and I guess that's, yeah, from the Ponces. The, the earlier of these citations from Pascal's Ponces concerns the wisdom involved in venerating customary human distinctions. The second provides a reason. How wisely, it, this, uh, Pascal from the Ponces, how wisely has it been ordained to distinguish men rather by the exterior, exterior show than by the interior endowments? Here's another person, and I disputing the way. 
Who shall have the preference in this case? Why the better man of the two? But I am as good as a man as he. So if no expedient be found, he must beat me or I must beat him. Well, but all this while he has four footmen at his back and I have but one. This is a visible advantage. We need only tell noses to discover it. Tis my part, therefore, to yield, and I am a blockhead if I contest the point. See here an easy method of peace, the great safeguard and supreme happiness of this world. And then you write, the superficial approval of social distinction is common, but the underlying philosophical reasons for that approval are different. Pope's text adds to Pascal's sense of the practical value of social distinction, an argument from the assumption of God's legible rather than hidden providence. Given God's justice, it is simply impossible that evident inequalities in the distribution of material goods could affect the happiness of the individual. You know, that this, Pat, it just really struck me, uh, was so fascinating. I, you know, I was once in Saudi Arabia and um, they have a, like the British system, they have the roundabouts. So, you know, I, I had such a hard time understanding like right away there because it's a little crazy. And I asked a, a Saudi friend of mine, you know, who has the right of way in these roundabouts? He said the Lexus first and then, <laughs> and then the BMW and then the Mercedes and then the Chevy Impala and then the other people. And it just totally and it, he, he was partly being facetious, but also partly t- stating a truth um, that that is much more evident in 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 certain parts of the world. Than it is in 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 the West, which has become increasingly more egalitarian, at least in its um, you know presentation. Uh, I mean, I think there's still we all see the hierarchies and the class uh, systems, but nonetheless, there's there's this idea um, that that uh, um, you know I one of the things that that I knew America was was uh, going down a different path. When I took my children to this um, uh, one of these um, theme parks that that I my father had taken to me uh, me to as a child, and there was a fast lane for people if you paid more. So when I was a kid, everybody had to stay in the same line. But now, if you had more money, you know you 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 you. So I just realized, oh, okay, it's very different. You know, if you look at the difference between first class like forty years ago in America and first class today, just completely different. There wasn't a lot of difference between first class and economy. Um, so I just thought that was really a fascinating point that he was making. And you know, you, do you, do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, sure. I I, I agree. So it's it's very interesting. I, I think. Um... Pascal is is um, he, he presents a God who is, who cannot be known. There's no, there, there is no point in humans thinking that they can uh, arrive at an understanding of the attributes of God, or the qualities of God, or understand God's ways. It's really something of a, of a different of a different of, di- of a different order of, of of knowledge. Thomas Hobbes, on at the other extreme, as you as you were just citing, um, really doesn't want God in his in 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 the in the in the picture of the evolution of human societies that he's presenting. But and I think Pope is somewhere in the middle. Pope often Pope says this of his own poem. He's trying to steer between extremes and find a find a middle ground, find something that everybody will will, will agree in. So he he sees the um uh, the value, the social value of there being order, of there being a hierarchy, because that it puts people in their place. That, you know, the, the person with four foot men goes first. The person with three foot men goes second, and 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 and, then, and, 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 and it's and it's simple. But um, he, unlike Pascal, simply being happy to say this is a you know just this is a merely human thing and perhaps doesn't relate to God's justice at all. We can disregard. It's not a case for God's justice to be to be invoked. Pope does want to find a reason. He wants to find a reason for order. And attribute and, and say that it's got something to do with the way God's made the world. Yeah. And one of his one of his reasons, which hasn't convinced people, not all people, right from Pope's day, is that um, those people who get to go first will always be worrying about losing what they've got, right. and those people who are last will always have the hope that one day they'll go first. Yeah, and hope. 
Yeah. And it's that balance of hope and fear that equalizes happiness, even though people have very different um, conditions in the world. Well, yeah, great point. Um, that's one of the things Thomas Sowell here, one of uh, our economists here, um, talks about, you know, that that what America provided for poor people was the hope of actually becoming middle class or even wealthy at some point. Um, and obviously the rich people have the fear of, of losing their wealth and losing their position. So, you know, for me, the single most profound uh, in this entire work for me, and I'd be curious to see what, what, what you found maybe in your, um, in your, uh, you know, deep reading of this amazing poem, what you found, what struck you as, as something that really profoundly struck you as being important and, uh, and deep, but this is a very Quranic because the Quran says we raise some of you over others as a test. Mm -hmm. And, and then there's another, there's several verses that deal with this uh, hierarchy in the Quran. Another one says that we made some of you a test for others. Will you be patient? And in the commentaries, they say the rich are a test for the poor. The poor are a test for the rich. The ignorant are a test for the learned. The learned are a test for the ignorant. And, 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 and so, but but what's interesting is there is a kind of deference to things like wealth and things like they're not seen as important, but they, they are seen as as um, social distinctions. And, and the rich are told to have compassion for the poor. And obviously, charity is a major uh, theme in the Quran of like helping people in less because there, for the grace of God, go I. This idea that, you know, that could be you. You could have been ensouled in a poor person's and your wealth has nothing to do with you. Like it's seen as it's a tribulation from God. But what's interesting is in the Islamic tradition, in the, in the afterlife, it's reversed. Like the rich people wish they were poor because the poor people enter paradise 500 years before the rich people. So, so it's, 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 everything's reversed. So the man with the four coach, uh, you know, four footmen and four horses going to wish he was the one with the one, you know, coachman. So it's, and, and, you know, obviously a Marxist reading of that would be, oh, well, yeah, it makes perfect sense. You know, this is social control. But what's fascinating for me is that these ideas came out of the crucible of persecution, that religions, even though governments use them as social control they were they did not come out the, the 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 prophets that brought these traditions were persecuted peoples very often they weren't in power it took christianity 300 years before it got into power uh in in islam it was not anywhere near it was much quicker but the the these verses were revealed in the crucible of persecution so it's it's a it's a very interesting thing, but I'm curious to what you would have to say about just what struck you. What I was going to say, what what hit me was the idea of the equality of happiness, and 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 it really gave me a, a different perspective on. And I'm wondering if Jefferson uh, might have even been influenced by Pope because I'm sure he'd read him, but. Um, when when uh, when Jefferson said, you know, all men are created equal and are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. Like we have that, th th you know, Pope's argument, and, and obviously you showed other people before him who had put this uh, forward, but his argument that there's, a, there's an equality in the ability to be happy, that a pauper can be as happy as a monarch and a monarch can be as miserable as a pauper. You know, I just, that just struck me as just incredibly profound. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and um, um, it's, it's, it's people. So Samuel Johnson, one of Pope's near contemporaries, slightly younger than Pope, um, coming to eminence in the, in the later 18th century, um, says he thinks it's because Pope hasn't seen poverty that he, uh, that he can... Um, dismiss it. Uh, Johnson feels quite easily. This, 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 he can say, "Well, it's okay to be poor because 
you have then the hope of, 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 of being rich or of, of, of having a better life. Um, Samuel Johnson's sense of that was he just hasn't really seen that amongst the poor. That isn't something he, that for him characterises the psychology of the, of the poor. Um, but Samuel Johnson famously likes to, to spoil people. So he's, he, I think he had a very, very pessimistic view of, of human nature in general and, 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 and thought happiness was, was not to be attained anywhere, really, but, um, uh, for, 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 for humans. Um, Pope perhaps that has that slightly more optimistic edge. He, he, he wants to see, he wants to see the possibility of, of, of human happiness because he has, I think, a, a strong fundamental belief in uh, the benevolence of God and, and the providential organisation of the world. And it, as, as for many of his contemporaries, it just, it just seems so, uh, um, but there has to be some kind of explanation for this problem of calamitous virtue, the fact that good, good people that we, we see around us are made to suffer. There must be there must be a reason for that, and and he's 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 seeking that reason, and um, it, yes, he, he he finds he finds that way. One of the one one of the things that has always struck me is very um, very important about this poem, and and and, and very rich is an, is another way in which Pope is trying to see the benevolence of of God and, and of, of God's providence in in, the, in creating the universe. Um, and it perhaps tends a bit more towards um, uh, some of the more enlightened my, enlightenment ideas we see in Pope, to getting towards the idea of, of human science, of the, of the human science, a kind of slightly more detached view of, 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 or study of, of human nature. But it's it's more around the, the beginning of Epistle three, which is where Pope deals with humans in in society. Um, and what I find, it, I'll, I'll read a bit of the passage if that's okay. And one of the things I find interesting about this is Pope uses the language of what, what in his time is modern material science. People who talk about the universe just as matter, as atoms bumping into one another and creating by chance what we see in front of us. He uses some of that language, but he turns it towards a, a picture which is, which is one of God's love. So he says, look round our world. Behold the chain of love combining all below and all above. See plastic nature working to this end. The single atoms each to other tend. Attract, attracted to the next in place. Formed and impelled its neighbour to embrace. See matter next with various life endued. Pressed to one centre still, the general good. See dying vegetables life sustain. See life dissolving, vegetate again. All forms that perish, other forms supply. By turns, we catch the vital breath and die. Like bubbles on the sea of matter born, they rise, they break, and to that sea return. Nothing is foreign, parts relate to whole. One all-extending, all-preserving soul connects each being, greatest with the least, made beast in aid of man and man of beast. All served, all serving, nothing stands alone. The chain holds on, and where it ends, unknown. So this that passage speaks to me a lot because um, one of my favourite passages. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It has it has that. Um, it takes the language of the materialists and says, well, I, "I can use that language too, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a picture of, of of God's love and of of human love as well, making societies work, making the, the universe work." Uh, and I feel. Um, whether you're whichever faith you're of, or if you're, or if you're a person of no faith, there's still something that you can see. You know, we, who who wants social discord? Who who positively wants um, pain and misery and suffering to be amplified and generated? Or who wouldn't prefer harmony and an order and mutual um, support and and, and, and benevolence? Um, and I think there's, there's there's a picture there of how one can move from looking at the world around you trying to understand its principles of operation and, and come up with a course of action as an individual and as a society and as a social group that leads to good outcomes. So uh, that's great. One passage that speaks great to me. Yeah. Well, I think two, two, two responses to that first, um, who would want discord? Well, the masters of war, certainly, I mean, there are people that love to rile up uh, uh, two groups and then sell weapons to them. You know, so unfortunately, you know, Raytheon, General Electric, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, CEOs out there that they they just start 
seeing great opportunities when strife breaks out. Um, uh, the second comment about um, what, what you said about um, Johnson, who, uh, you know, I lived in, in uh, with Bedouin in West Africa, and essentially they're like homeless people, you know, I mean, homeless people set up tents and like we have a whole tent city out here uh, in California because we have one of the largest homeless populations. Um, so, I, you know, I lived with some of the poorest people on the planet. And and at the time, Mauritania was considered, I think, maybe the third poorest country. <laughs> They've since discovered a lot of natural gas. But um I, what struck me is how joyful these people were and how genuinely happy they were. And and I think one of the worst things about our culture, Western civilization, is is we we don't have dignity in poverty. I think there probably was um, in the feudal system uh, more dignity with the poverty. But I, I mean, I, maybe I'm being nostalgic. I don't know. But um, but I have seen dignity in poverty in in many places in the Muslim world. Um, and, and, and it's, I've, I really haven't, haven't seen it with rare exception in the West. Um, there's something very degrading about poverty. And, and I think it's, it's partly because of the deeply materialistic, uh, aspect of, of the, the, you know, the modern culture, but yeah, I, I don't agree with, uh, with Johnson on that at all, uh, because I really have seen, what we would consider real destitution in terms of just material. I mean, people that everything they owned was in a small box and yet they had smiles etched on their faces. You know, I mean, I literally knew people there that just had permanent smiles. They were just happy people. Uh, so anyway, I, the introduction is just there's it was just so rich and there's just so many things in there, um, but going to the um, the, uh, the 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 some of the things that uh, yeah I I love this passage here um, on uh, it's on page eleven uh, then say not man's imperfect heaven in fault. Say rather man's as perfect as he ought, his knowledge measured to his state and place, his time a moment, a point, his space. If it be perfect in a certain sphere, what matter sooner or late or here or there, the blessed today is as completely so as who began a thousand years ago. I love that passage. It's That's a very Muslim passage because... Um, Imam al-Ghazali said that uh, that this is a perfect world for the purpose of the world. And 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 man was created uh, with a perfection for the purpose that man was meant to serve. So that that's a very um, that's a very uh, you know Muslim view of of you know people. There's a verse in the Quran in Surah uh, the uh, a chapter called the the Dominion. It's a later chapter, but earlier it was revealed early, um, where it says, um, you know, that God created the heavens and the earth, and you will not see any flaw in the creation. And then it says, look again. You know, in other words, with that first look, you're, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see all these flaws. Mm -hmm. But it's saying, look deeper, look again, and, and your eye will come back weary from trying to find a flaw. Um, and then also this another on page 13 hope humbly then with trembling pinion soar wait the great teacher death and god adore what future bliss he gives not thee to know but gives that hope to be thy blessings now hope springs eternal in the human breast man never is but always to be blessed the soul uneasy and confined from home rest and expatiates in a life to come the beautiful um this beautiful uh, passage i mean some of these they're just so stunningly and obviously i mean you you've shown the you know i always um when i i taught a freshman seminar 
and, and I would I would show them the rough draft. We have a rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. You know, it's it's a great. If you've never seen it, it's worth looking up because it's you know, everything's like crossed out and new work. Originally, it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which was locks. You know, and I guess Jefferson mixed that one, being the philosopher that he was. But um, yeah, I just uh, amazing. Um, you know, j- just the, uh, let's see. Pope's, um, Pope's manuscripts for the poem were, did have quite a lot of crossings through as well. So it took him, it took him a long time to get to these precise formulations of, of, of these phrases. And we, it's, that's one of the phrases you'll hear people use in, in, in the UK still in, if, if someone's. Yeah, whole spring just, eternal. Whole spring's eternal. You, people yeah, no, use it every day, yeah. Yeah, learning a little learning is a dangerous thing. I mean, he he really gave us quite a few, um, you know, just very memorable turns of phrase. Yeah, quite stunning. Um, you had a wonderful uh, footnote on page nineteen one ninety, um, which is about the bliss of man could pride that blessing fine is not to act or think beyond mankind. Um, and and it's is not to know or think beyond mankind. Pope removes the contradiction of man knowing what man can't know by revising to act, which suggests in person uh, in personation or stagecraft as well as agency. The bliss of man could pride that blessing find is not to act or think beyond mankind. The cleaner text makes this couplet a contradiction. Man could never think beyond man. Montaigne of moderation. A man may both. Uh, be too much in love with virtue and be excessive in a just action. Holy Writ agrees with this. Be not wise that you should, but be soberly wise. The citation is probably Romans 12, 3, for I say through the grace given unto the, uh, me to every man that is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For a contrasting view, see Montaigne of experience. No generous mind can stop in in itself. It will still pretend further and beyond its power. It sallies beyond its effects. Montaigne apology. Anyway, it goes on. But I I just thought that was such an interesting, um, you know, annotation on that, on what he's saying. Because, uh, again, the Quran says uh, you've only been given a little bit of knowledge. You know, there's this idea we in our tradition, God, God is that there's a transcendent and then the imminent perspective and the, the transcendent in our theology. They say whatever occurs to your mind, God is other than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so God is beyond concept. You, we cannot conceptualize God. He's out. God is outside of uh, binaries. There's actually a, a, a verse in in the 47th chapter that says we created everything in binaries and then it says and there's nothing like god in other words there there, there there's no binary there um and and so uh that unknowability you know that the human uh, we read one of the, one of the uh books we read was bartleby the scrivener you've probably read that uh, melville yeah yeah um, so I, I I used to uh, teach that. So I've I've read it several times, and I finally I felt like I really finally nailed it. You know this this last reading, because um, you know the character, um, the 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 uh, the owner uh, who hires Bartleby, he, he's constantly commenting on his his uh, you know he thinks he's got them all understood, except for Bartleby. You know he's just like it's constantly driving them nuts like what's going on with it you know these people that we have in our lives like some people we just get we you know we know you know what you see is what you get they don't have a sleeve to wear their heart on but then there's other people that you're just like what is going on with this person you you just cannot figure them out and and at the end i just felt like melville was saying you know ah bartleby ah humanity It's that what that man never understood, you're lucky if you work yourself out in this life. You know, if if you can come to self, not don't even bother trying to know anybody else. And 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 I, I, you know, I feel that's a a real theme in this book 
you know, is in this poem. Is any thoughts? I, I, I think you're you're quite right, and um, Pope, Pope takes quite a, a big a big subject. I think he he, he invokes Isaac Newton, you know, the, the the first person really to to, to quantify how, how how gravitational force operated, um, and to and to set it out in in very precise mathematical terms. And he says, you know, Newton might have been able to work those things out, but could he could he could he describe a, even a single movement of his own mind? Um, uh, so, so that, that 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 same kind of warning to be humble in the face of your own of your own being and 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 and, and the source of your being, um, I think it extends extends through through this poem. And Pope's always you know, he wants to he's telling people not to be prideful. Don't don't imagine that um, humanity has now arrived through science or any other means at, at, at a way of understanding all there is to be known about. The universe so don't don't think beyond yourself right um, um but at the same time and this is one of the the things i find very interesting about the poem as well is that he says don't don't think beyond yourself but at the same time the poem invites us to extend ourselves to be better versions of ourselves right. so we should, so we shouldn't rest easy with who we are because we should strive to be the, the best kind of human that we could be to have the, the the best appropriately human view but we shouldn't think beyond that so you know there's there's a challenge there's a challenge there i think again for that the anyone can can pick up no matter what their faith background or their political value you know you want to be the best kind of person you can be but where's your limit where when have you overstepped into arrogance or pride or um, making some false assumptions or acting on behalf of others when you when, when, when you when you have no right to perhaps so yeah um ghazali has a great poem imam al ghazali one of our great um scholastics and and mystics as well but he has a poem uh where he says you know you ask where is god and you don't even know where you are like <laughs> in this in this great universe like what are your coordinates you know <laughs> and then he says um uh, you 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 drink your water and you don't even know how it comes out the other end you know and and you want to know like who god is <laughs> uh to that uh what what you were just speaking self love is you know his take on it is so interesting like mm -hmm. you know narcissism is obviously a perversion of something which is natural which is to love yourself and then you know the the you know the kind of aristotelian moderation like self-love is necessary and the extremes would be narcissism and self-loathing and so finding that but but he's using it to really you know he says on 36 self-love and reason to one end aspire pain their aversion pleasure their desire and this is again very um you know uh the Muslims pretty much, and the Quran, I think, concurs with the the uh, the the, or rather, the Platonic view concurs with the Quran to say it more appropriately for us. Um, this idea of a a ranking, um, you know, that reason is given to govern appetite and and irascibility, and and irascibility is to ward off harm, and appetite is to accrue benefits and obviously pleasure being one of them in moderation and then he says our greatest evil or our great pleasure or wrongly or rightly understood our greatest evil or our greatest good modes of self-love the passions we may call tis real good or seeming moves them all but since not every good we can divide and reason bids us for our own provide passions though selfish if their means be fair list under reason and deserve her care those that imparted court a nobler aim exalt their kind and take some virtues name just fantastic stuff yeah yes i think pope is trying to work out how those um the, the desire to preserve one's own existence that is you know that, that that desire he see he, he thinks god god has clearly imp implanted that in people you look around that's that's just something that, that people want to do is um uh, it, it must be to some end it must be to some purpose 
um, what, what, what goods is is this form of self love doing? Uh, and, and provided, as, as as you as you say, there there are um, rational limits set upon it, um, or there there are um, and, and reason in this reason in this case is perhaps not um, cold, but is is quite um, again it's quite loving, it's quite sociable, um, as 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 long as my um, uh, as, as long as my self love doesn't detract from the right to exist, the means of existence, or the, the uh, of, of other beings, then um, uh, th- then it's a then it's a reasonable form of self love. Right, and he'll obviously develop that further. He get, he has some really wonderful things to say about moving from self love to love of our fellow man, and then to extend it beyond even to to you know, the animals and, and, uh, and, and the world itself on page 46. I just, this was another fantastic, uh, for me, uh, virtu- virtuous and vicious. Every man must be few in the extreme, but all in the degree, the rogue and fool by fits is fair and wise. And even the best by fits, what they despise Tis but by parts, we follow good or ill for vice or virtue self directs it. Still each individual seeks a several goal, but heaven's great view is one, and that the whole. The counter works each folly and caprice that disappoints the effect of every vice, the happy frailties to all ranks applied. Uh, shame to the virgin, to the matron pride. That, you know, it reminded me of the, um, uh, the um, you know, the, uh, the web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill uh, together, you know, in uh, uh, Shakespeare, that, that, uh, you know that that this dialectic in in the uh, the poem is very strong mm-hmm. between the, the the isthmus. You know this human being that is kind of a, a an interstitial space between the angels and the beasts, mm-hmm. and and rising to this higher nature is is you know is the struggle, and that's where I feel that he's less Christian in that the salvation for him is through the practice of virtue. That he's really calling us to to being virtuous human beings, and and fighting these, you know these 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 downward pulls, but uh, you know I just thought that was such a fantastic. Um... Yes, yeah. discouraging people, yeah, um, discouraging people from think, from thinking they can be good all the time in the same way that no 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 one person is is all kinds of people. Um, an individual person will be some days good, some days less good, some days positive. And so, yeah, great encouragements to um, introspection and, and, and humility um, throughout the poem. And and then on on forty eight, he's got this wonderful just about the toys and and uh, you know here um, some strange comfort every state attend and pride bestowed on all a common friend. Some uh, see some fit passion, every age supply hope travels through though, uh, quits us when we die. Behold the child by nature's kindly law, pleased with a rattle tickled with a straw. Some livelier plaything gives his youth delight a little louder, but as empty, quite scarves, garters, gold, amuse his riper stage and beads and prayer books are the toys of age. Pleased with the bauble still as that before, till tired he sleeps and life's poor play is o'er. I mean, there's obviously resonance with Shakespeare there, but I found there's a verse in uh, in the uh, in the Quran that I just thought it was so almost you know it's it's it says that you know know that the life of this world is but play and amusement. Um, and, and then ornamentation, and then vying f- with one another uh, in in children and in the acquisition of wealth. Uh, and, and 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 it's and then it says it's like a rain that comes down, and and the green sprouts up, and 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 it and and it's beautiful. But then you see it wither and become chafe, and then blow away in the wind. I mean, it really struck me. Like that passage is so similar to that verse in the Quran, um, you know, this idea of of play and then, you know, as children and then entertainment, like children amuse themselves. But then as we grow older, we need, you know, entertainment. We need to be amused, you know, 
uh, by by other by other uh, you know plays and and novels and television now and and these type of things. So I just I I thought that was just a really fantastic. Um, I think he's quite in some ways quite well. Uh, interesting. He he includes um, beads and prayer books um, as the distractions of later life. So he in a way it's the it's the uh, critical attitude to the to the mere display of. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When you get old, if you start to worry about your death then and what's going to happen next, well, then, then you're just distracting yourself with another another one of the toys that's appropriate. Yeah, to a stage I thought of it. yeah it's cool. and, and there's something horrible about people that find uh, uh, faith in, in old age and then become, you know, these these kind of, you know, judgmental people that are like condemning the youth for sowing their wild oats when they were doing the same thing when they were young right i mean it's a very common trope uh fantastic uh there was a few other things i wanted to before we open it up for any questions um so many great lines in here i mean i just What what was your favorite section? Because it's it, it's considered an incomplete poem. Like he wanted to add more to it. Yeah. Yes, I mean he he, um, he has these ideas throughout his life of, of of writing a very full book of poems. Which not this this was in some ways the uh, he called it like a scale on a map. Um, so this was the abstract part, and then he would move on to much more practical um, questions of of how to how to live a a, a particular life. But it, he he didn't necessarily finish all of those i really like the, the the third epistle i find that very very interesting and where he's, he gives a, a historical account of how how societies um emerge and it's partly it's partly mythical and it's partly you know probably the best guess at the time of how of how human societies did start to um did start to um to make themselves i i think there's um an interesting passage around line 241 of Epistle 3. Um, Which page? Um, it's page 67, sorry. Um, which is where Pope is talking about um, the moment where he thinks, uh, the f- he thinks the first societies would have been patriarchal societies where a king was identified simply on the basis of, uh, of strength and, and virtue. Uh, and that a kind of natural religion and um, uh, close social ties would have gone along with that. But then he then he thinks it's it's part of the history of things that um, political organisation tends to to become corrupted. And this is this is his his version of describing that. He says, "Who first taught souls enslaved and realms undone the enormous faith of many made for one?" So that is rather than the the, the king being the um, having the responsibility. Of, of 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 his position, He's, the king starts to think that the others are made for him, are made for his use. Who t- who first came up with that? That proud exception to all nature's laws to invert the world and counterwork its cause. So he then he gives an I- an idea of how this might happen. Force first made conquest, and that conquest law, till superstition taught the tyrant awe, then shared the tyranny, then lent it aid and gods and con- of conquerors, slaves of subjects made. She, midst the lightning's blaze and thunder's ground, when rocked the mountains and when groaned the ground, she taught the weak to bend, the proud to pray, to power unseen and mightier far than they. So I, I, I won't continue, but this is... Oh, fantastic. I, 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 how false religion and, and, and exploitative politics can, can go together in these, in these early stages uh, of... of of human social development. Um, well, that was one of my favorite passages. Fantastic, um, and and very modern. Like really, mm. yeah. Th- these these are very modern ideas because th- this is at mm. a time when the divine right of kings was just beginning to be challenged mm. in in Western uh, society. I mean, he was born what 1688, right? The year of the glorious revolution. So, mm. and then Hobbes, I think, you know, I mean, Hobbes had already made made his uh you know mark at at just um realizing you know the kind of harm that that uh, a lot of religion 
produced. And I think he's addressing that here in that in that mm-hmm. passage. You know, just the the abuse, the power, um, the, yeah, does. Uh, also, very interesting on seventy five. Ask of the learned the way; the learned are blind. This bids to serve and that to shun mankind. Some place the bliss in action, some in ease. Those call it pleasure and contentment. These some sunk to beast find pleasure end in pain. Some swelled to gods confessed even virtue vain or indolent to each extreme they fall to trust in everything or doubt of all. Who thus define it say they more or less than this that happiness is happiness. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And then, and then this is where I just wow. I, you know, this just floored me um, here. Equal is common sense and common ease. Remember, man, the universal cause acts not by partial, but by general laws and makes that happiness we justly call subsist not in the good of one, but all. There's not a blessing individuals find, but some way leans and hearkens to the kind. No bandit fierce, no tyrant mad with pride, no cavern hermit rests self-satisfied. Who most to shun or hate mankind pretend, seek an admirer or fix a friend. And then order is heaven's first law and this confessed. Some are and must be greater than the rest. More rich, more wise, but who infers from hence that such are happier? Shocks all common sense, heaven to mankind. Impartial we confess if all are equal in their happiness. I mean, I just, that really just struck me as just such an extraordinary statement because yeah. you know we have billionaires that commit suicide and mm-hmm. you know and 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 paupers that flourish in their poverty with with mm-hmm. real joy and and I've, I've i've seen both i admire the um the sense that the, the truly human goods the, the goods of this world at least um are, are always with and for other people as well. There's not there's not a, an entirely solitary good. It can't, it right. can't be good just for you. Right. Um, if it, that wouldn't really be a human, a, tr- a truly human. That's a, that's that's um, debasing the nature of the human. If you th- if you think there are things that are truly good for you that you alone could enjoy, all all real human goods are actually shared with uh, with others and have right. some sense of the of the of the of the wider world of the social whole of 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 of, of the way god's created the, the universe yeah and then again on 83 what makes all physical or moral ill there deviates nature and here wanders will god sends not ill if rightly understood or partial ill is universal good or change admits or nature lets it fall short and but rare till man improved it all we just as wisely might of heaven complain that righteous Abel was destroyed by Cain. Um, you know, it's interesting. You said, you know, in that passage you read earlier, who started it all? He asked that question in the, in the Jewish tradition. Cain did. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and then whatever is is it is is right. The, this world is true was made for Caesar, but for Titus too. And which more blessed who chained his country say, or he whose virtue sighed to lose a day. Uh, I loved your footnote. That was a wonderful Suetonius. Um, mm. I, I found my dad reading Suetonius once and, and I asked him, he said, oh, he, he fills some lacunae that Tacitus and others miss, but not, not very often read. Um, but I wonderful um, little note about on an, uh, on another that you know he was always doing favors every day and on another occasion remembering at dinner that he had done nothing for anybody all day he gave utterance to that memorable and praiseworthy remark friends I have lost the day what a, what a wonderful beautiful statement uh, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he said that. Uh, you know, every every art, uh, articulation, every joint has charity written on it every day. So, so you should give charity for every joint in your body every day. Um, wow. Yeah, a wit's a feather and a chief a rod. An honest man's the noblest work of God. 
fame but from death a villain's name can save as justice tears his body from the grave um you know the ending i just yeah it was just it was it was really that the yeah here this this section on 96 um god loves from whole to parts but human soul must rise from individual to the whole self-love but serves the virtuous mind to wake as the small pebble as the small pebble stirs the peaceful lake the center moved a circle straight succeeds another still and still another spreads friend parent neighbor first it will embrace his country next and next all human race wide and more wide the overflowings of the mind take every creature in of every kind earth smiles around with boundless bounty blessed and heaven beholds its image in his breast i mean wow what what a vision yeah. you know, it's just it's amazing. Of the universe yeah yeah no it's it's so beautiful just just as and then come then my friend my genius come along you know oh master of the poet and the song and while the muse now stoops or now ascends to man's low passions or their glorious ends. I'm beautiful. Shall then this verse to future age pretend here we are, you know, a yeah. few hundred years later, read it. And I love how the great poets really know they're going to be remembered. <laughs> you know, they just, Shakespeare has that, Homer has it, you know, they they really, they have that uh, wonderful recognition that that it's not them. You know, the muse is working through them. Um, and, and, uh, and so there's, there's kind of a, you know, there's, there's an absence of ego. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like a boast. It's a recognition of something, you know, the, the muse was working here. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, thou wert my guide, philosopher and friend, that urged by thee I turned the tuneful art from sounds to things from fancy to the heart. For wit's false mirror held up nature's light, shewing, shewed erring pride, whatever is, is right. That reason, passion, answer one great aim. That true self-love and social are the same. That virtue only makes our bliss below and all our knowledge is ourselves to know. Wow incredible work thank you so much for this uh doctor uh thank, thank I mean, you for, for, for allowing me to to speak with you about the, about the poem yeah no it's just i mean i was just really just affected by your work and and the, the annotations just opened up so much so we can uh yeah we can open it up if anybody has any I mean, it's a great opportunity with dr jones um being so uh, steeped in in this incredible poet. Well, it looks like we, we do have a couple of people raising hands. So I can take Amir Hamid first because he's had his hand raised a while. Uh, Amir, I'm putting you on. Uh, uh, hello, Dr. Jones. Uh, thank you and assalamu alaikum to everyone else. Um, thank you, Zaytuna, for for uh, for organizing this, and uh, uh, for Dr. Jones for for for, for joining us. Um, it, your introduction is, I think, an incredible contribution to the to the scholarship. Um, the, the the previous people whom, whom I've uh, read who talk about an essay on man, uh, there seems to be uh, you know a, a an understanding that the poem is. It, it, it should be read as a poem, and um, and and I think Harry Solomon in the Rape of the Text talks about how uh, you know, we're not doing that. But no one seems to come up with a, a model uh, in, in in terms of how it should be read as a poem, uh, and and I think yours yours does that. And uh, so it's and I think you have this this this, this wonderful line uh, in, in your uh, on Roman numeral page uh, 20, uh, 24. The poeticalness of Pope's text is intrinsic to its essayism, and 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 it, it seemed to me that you were um, the way that 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 it, it, that's the case is that it, it's it's more of a communicative uh, in in a more of a communicative way these these subtle changes of of tense and mood and and some of the rhythm and stress. I, I was wondering if if that could be pushed further uh, in terms of. Uh, 
there's this uh, uh, J.W. McHale in his lectures on poetry, uh, in his definition of poetry, he says, uh, if the technical art of poetry consists in making patterns out of language, the substantial and vital function of poetry will be analogous. It will be to make patterns out of life. And, and I, I was wondering if, if he's using poetry, maybe not just as a, as a communicative uh, device to be able to make these, these subtle shifts and for ambiguity and these things, but, and, and, and maybe you, you, you mentioned this in your introduction, but I didn't, I didn't, perhaps I didn't pick up on it, but I was wondering if he's using this patterned language of poetry to make, to, to, to create assumptions in the universe that there are these patterns to make his arguments his some of his theological arguments, you know, that custom is is law, really, that, that, that we, to, to, to make those uh, uh, decisive arguments. Good point. Thank you. So what, what a wonderful um, question. Uh, so, so rich and complex and, and, and detailed. Um, I, I, I think you're I think you're right that um, Pope wants to. Um, philosophy on its own can be quite abstract. It doesn't, it doesn't show us um, the human experience of ideas or, or, of, or, of, or of the world. I think the, 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 the kind of essay that Pope is writing, this um, verse essay, is, is about showing us that experience, showing us how humans move from one position to another. Uh, and I agree with you, I think that's a pattern. It's not just about the patterning of, of language, pa the patterning of language both in the making of lines, which, which are very memorable and, and stay with us, but also in making the, the larger shape of the poem, is, is absolutely a, um, a, a desire to, to change the way people are, to change, to change people's behaviour. That's, that's the, the great reforming end of, 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 the, of, of the poet. I mean, Pope has his um, uh, uh, Roman and, and Greek models to refer back to. The, the, the point of poetry is to delight and to instruct uh, and and instructing isn't isn't just dry. It's not it's not simply the imparting of doctrine uh, that could be repeated, but the uh, the the, the um, demonstration of um, attitudes and points of view and feelings and thoughts that we can adopt and which will change our lives. I think that I think that it, that is that is precisely. I think that's what Pope means by being by being an ethical writer. He'll be, he he talks at one point about writing a short system of ethics. On the Horatian model, so taking the, the 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 Latin poet Horace as his model for what ethics are, and I think that I think the ethics there is about change, changing the way that your reader thinks and acts in their in their in their daily lives. I think that is his ambition. Um, so I I, I I I agree with with the with the proposal that you were making in your question. Yeah, great, I, great point. Thank you for that. Thank you. He's such a he's such a you know he's a, he's a little bit of a stickler because there you know there is a I mean Shakespeare purposely uh, you know breaks uh, meter when he wants to and and Pope apparently when he edited Shakespeare he corrected you know some of the 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 beats of Shakespeare and that I mean what gall <laughs> you know that's quite. Although Shakespeare was, wasn't as popular during his time as he became later. Yeah. The, the, the appreciation was just beginning. And Pope yeah. also, um, an, one of the other great poets of the early 17th century was John Donne. And Pope yeah. did versions of his poems. And he said that the poems of Dr. Dr. John Donne versified as if they weren't, as if they weren't verse when, when uh, okay. he found them. But, uh, so he... Dunn, Dunn's uh, great. Um, all right, moving on to the next question, uh, we have Ariana. So Ariana, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, hi. So, um, salam alaikum, and hello, I'm Dr. Jones. Um, just uh, listening to this discussion, it was it was really nice, um, and it kind of reminded me of in among the Muslim circles, we say when two or more people are gathered in the remembrance of God or the discussion of God, it's um, it's considered a form of worship. So it's um, it's I kind of regarded it a little bit like that too. But um, in listening to your input in the discussion um about the author, um, I was just a bit struck about how it seems like you have some understanding of Islam and of the Quran, 
And so I just wanted to know in your study, you know, the Enlightenment was a really interesting age of disc. A lot of people were exploring their views of God, um, other than just talking about philosophy. You know, it's, it seemed like it was a personal journey in a sense for um, the Europe. So um, I wanted to know how your work on um, the um, Alexander Pope and then also um, your studies have contributed to your sort of if it's not too personal if to your own personal journey and like how you sort of how you view God and if you have a particular religious tradition that you're you're fond of thank you for the question and um I, it is a personal question but I have no I, I don't I don't hesitate to answer it I happen to be a person of, of no particular faith um I was I was brought up in a in a um broadly Christian environment um, that had that had more to do with the um, the, the Methodist um, branch of the um, Anglican um, Christian Church was, was was the only one with which I had much um, contact when I was when I was growing up um, so I come from no particular faith tradition um, but I see a great deal uh, I suppose I do have um, uh, social and political commitments which to, to my mind, bear comparison with some of the commitments that I see exemplified in, in people of lots of faiths. Um, uh, and um, I suppose for, for my, my personal journey um, in relation to, to this text is perhaps seeing how um, a, a text which um, is, was, was understood to be very central, to be a very mainstream statement of um, early Enlightenment philosophical and theological principles, um, and for and for that reason has been regarded as quite dull um, or, or uninteresting in in in, um, uh, in in lots of English studies departments for the, for a number of a number of years. I wanted to see how, if and how, it could be made to speak to to questions that that, that I felt were interesting and important, as well as questions that were important for a person of Pope's faith and 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 for people of other faiths. And it was it was wonderful to hear um, Sheikh Hamza um, illustrate the the, the 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 connections between Pope's thinking and and uh, and, and and the Quran. Um, so for me, that was the that was the interesting. Um, question to see how this way of thinking about um, God as a um, as, as a force that made the universe um, uh, something that could be brought together by or improved by love and acts of charity and goodness and and and, the, and how people um, at, attempting to be full people to be the fullest um, kind of person they could be might intuit something of, of, of what they should do. So we know that our we know that our our own um, perspectives on the universe are limited. Um, we can just accepting those limits doesn't necessarily mean sitting back and doing nothing. We still want to engage. We still want to try. We still want to exert ourselves as humans in the world. How should we do that? We need to, we need to, we need to launch ourselves into an inquiry or into a, into a, an act of faith in, in some way to, to 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 try to act. So in, in perhaps in quite a, a secular and socially minded way. Um, those were the kinds of questions that that were that were speaking um, to me. I, I mean, it is interesting to place um, Pope's poem in this bigger history of European Enlightenment thought, which does um, a little more fully start to think about the relationship between the, the major world religions, for example, and to see um, historical connections between them and, and commonalities in, in the way in which um, uh, religious traditions um, develop. Um, I've, I've just been reading a little recently about a, a later 18th century linguist and translator and a, um, a judge in the East India Company, um, uh, William Jones, um, uh, who was also a translator um, from Arabic as well as Sanskrit and, and Persian, P Persian being the administrative language of the, of, of the Mughal Empire and, and therefore of, of large parts of the territory that the East India Company was responsible for. Um, and he was very interested in uh, understanding, um, and s s uh, as far as he was able, Islamic legal traditions as well as Hindu legal traditions, and, and, and thinking about the ways in which, um, full of injustices as it, as it was to my mind, thinking about ways in which uh, British and Islamic legal traditions might 
cohabit, uh, in, in which people might um, live, live alongside one another. And I think in some ways Pope, Pope's is, is thinking along those kinds of lines, the, the kind of big ecumenical tradition. How does how do we think about the all of those things that are generally true about humans? They're, they're probably going to be true of people of, of, of all faiths in all all times and all places. And in some ways, that's that's one of the things the Enlightenment, the the, the, the Western European uh, Enlightenment, um, tries to do to think about humanity on, in that very general way. And again, thank you for the question, and, and uh, thank you for sharing your, your time. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, we are at the one and a half hour mark. Uh, all right, um, I have Basman next. I'm asking him to unmute. Hello, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you. you touched upon the question that I was going to ask, but I'm still. Um, so he, yeah. It, 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 and I apologize if this was answered very clearly in the text, but it was my first reading, and so um, um, it wasn't clear to me. And, I, and, and from the discussions, maybe it isn't clear. But um, you know, he, he, I see this kind of pushing on the two ends. Uh, when two people desire the same thing, conflict occurs, um, and he's pushing towards the pursuit of virtue. Um, and 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 you kind of mentioned it as well, and I'm looking for does he um, discuss or suggest or um, kind of can we infer from 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 the poem and from the discussions that uh, you've had on the book? Um, um, can we infer any path or uh, direction that he is pushing people towards? Because you can. It seems like it's almost pursuit of virtue means by default, if there's not going to be any conflicts, all those people with a type personalities who are pushing the envelope, the people pushing technology, um, even would he have approved of today's advances in technology, knowing that all this competition, all this conflict, all this strife that occurs because of it, um, where would he push people towards? Like, is there an asymptote from the top and from the bottom that he's pushing people towards? How do I... How do we how do we navigate that? How do we understand the text from that perspective? Great Thank question. You. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. Thank, thanks again for another very interesting question. I think my um, I, I, I would say that it's in some of Pope's key metaphors that the answer to this question lies. One of them is the family. So. Um, and again, this is this is I, I say this without necessarily being, these being my beliefs, but perhaps Pope's beliefs. Um, what makes a king? Well, it's 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 the father of the people. Um, family life is a, is a kind of model for social life. So I think Pope thinks of families and and the love that exists within families and the way in which families function is is a, is a model. It's something that can be fallen fallen back on. How if we if we depart from that kind of familial love in which people um, love themselves in one another, um, then something is going is, has gone wrong. So it's, it's any any moment when people have, have departed from from that. Other other, other examples of, of these metaphors, which are which are quite powerful, are, are perhaps around um, agriculture and horticulture, the development of of of, of plant life. In, in, if we if we're helping nature on its way. We're good gardeners. If we're good farmers, if we're if we're if we're bringing things from um, the resources that nature has given us, we're we're, we're expanding and developing resources. Um, then then we're probably okay. But if we are if we're being extractive or if we're destroying, if we then then you know. So I think if the question is what what does Pope actually think virtue is, I think it, I think we we go to these key metaphors of of um, Familial love and responsibility, um, gardening and 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 care and, and the development of of, of, of agriculture, and there, there could be others. Where he, he talks about the, the chain of being, that, that orderly system of, of of hierarchy, which is also a, a set of obligations and responsibilities for for everybody within it. If you think you're not part of the chain, you're wrong. So it's only it's it's only when you have that sense of your connectedness to the rest of the of, of, of the universe that that you could be acting virtuously. 
Yeah, great. Thank hey, you so much. Yeah, thank you for that question too. Is is a really interesting. I mean, I think I, I don't uh, see if you you agree with this, um, but uh, I think he he he's very much in a virtue ethics tradition. So I, I, I'm sure, like Aurelius and Nicomachean ethics, I mean, these would resonate greatly with him. You know, he'd probably be a friend with Alistair McIntyre if he was alive today. You know. But uh, from the Dunciad, because he he brought up a really important point that I wanted to bring up with you and really forgot is he seems to be very wary of science and 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 he's very concerned and I think that's more in the Dunciad. Uh, I think it's in the Dunciad, but yeah, the end of the Dunciad he says, "In vain, in vain, the all composing hour resistless falls. The muse obeys the power. She comes, she comes. The sable." throne behold of night primeval and of chaos old before her fancy's gilded clouds decay and all its varying rainbows die away which shoots in vain its momentary fires the meteor drops and in a flash expires as one by one at dread medea's strain the sickening stars fade off the ethereal plain as argus eyes by Hermes wand oppressed closed one by one to everlasting rest Thus at her felt approach and secret might, art after art goes out, and all is night. See skulking truth to her old cavern, to her old cavern uh, fled. This this is where it gets interesting. Uh, yeah. See skulking truth to her old cavern fled, mountains of casustry heaped o'er her head. Philosophy that leaned on heaven before shrinks to her second cause and is no more. I mean, that's uh, such a powerful, you know, he's seeing something that I don't even, I mean, Bacon obviously begins this process, so he's aware of what's happening, but for him to see that first cause, the metaphysics is disappearing from the world, the, the search for the first primal cause. And now it's empirical science that is beginning to reign supreme. So he's really seeing this, you know, so, so uh, shrinks to her second cause and is no more physic of metaphysic begs defense. And metaphysic calls for aid on sense. See mystery to mathematics fly. I mean, that's just such an incredible <laughs> statement given where we are today, because that's, that's the stem. It's all stem. That's where we're at. And he saw this, you know, uh, in vain, they gaze toward turn giddy, rave and die. Religion blushing veils her sacred fires and unawares morality expires. No, nor public flame, nor private dares to shine, nor human spark is left, nor glimpse divine. Lo, thy dread empire, chaos is restored. Light dies before thy uncreating word. Thy hand, great anarch, lets the curtain fall, and universal darkness buries all. I mean, wow. <laughs> you know, what a vision. And for him to see that at that time, you know, Kierkegaard, one of my favorite, uh, it's it's in his notebooks, but he said that very few people see creeping villainy mm -hmm. uh, because they have neither the imagination nor the dialectical ability. And and one of the, one of my favorite lines that we didn't look at, but you know, in and I, you know, this is me decades ago that this first struck me. He says, you know, vice is a monster of so frightful mean as to be hated needs but to be seen, but seen too oft familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. I mean, he I think he really saw something powerful about what was coming. And Nietzsche obviously is next in line. You know, he's he 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 sees the same vision. And from a secular um, atheistic perspective, attempts to 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 give us a solution, but uh, I just uh, you know that that those are I think they're the last lines, aren't they, of the Danciad? Yeah. Yes, those are the last lines, and it's it's a wonderful illustration for you to have brought to us because it, in some ways it's the it's the it's the negative image of of the end of the essay on man with that opening out of 
possibilities to the universe and here's the universe closing closing in on itself now when when all of the all of the principles have, have been have been abandoned order ab chaos right i mean that's the like he the he's seeing the chaos emerging you know i think uh shakespeare in in hamlet sees that 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 you know because he's he's got the old world of order which is his father and then the new world of power um which is his his uncle you know mm. and the poison is in the ear which is such a weird place to poison mm. you know it's like the new ideas that are coming in you know and then fort and brass you know power i mean he actually uses two words of power fort and brass mm. you know it, he comes in when all the chaos at the end of the play you know th- this is the modern world it's it power is going to determine everything because order is lost and when when chaos b- people beg for order and that's when that's when the demagogues come that's when they show up and they start telling people we're going to set everything right we're going to bring back the order mm. again but, but just to go back to one of the the points about the um about pope's biographical background in his early life that we started with um when william the third this quite um aggressively protestant monarch came to the throne in in, in 1688-1689 one of the first things he did and, and continued to do throughout his reign was to wage war against france and um a lot of the well, the, some of the first institutions of, of British state finance, so the Bank of England, for example, and a modernised stock exchange and so on, were founded to enable William III to wage war against France. Um, so this sense of a, of, a, of a new world being founded, a world which does um, uh, thrive on conflict, which which has not learned the lessons of the civil war of Britain and tried to create social harmony and, and, and peace and so on, even if that means accepting that well, the person with four footmen gets to go in ahead of me because I've only got one. We, we can accept those kinds of uh, injustice because the alternative is anarchy. But I think Pope sees in in this kind of modern war machine, which is starting to 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 be born, um, some of the threats as well as the as in as in the world of um, uh, scientific philosophy, kind of materialistic and me- mechan- mechanical philosophy. Great. Thank you for that question because you you brought up something that I was wanted to bring up. Yeah. And any other questions? Um, yeah, we can we can take another. I hope I hope it's not with Dr. Jones' permission. I I don't want to. I know it's getting late over there. So do you do you have a few more minutes with us? Yes, that'd be fine. Oh, great. In that case, we do have Mustafa. So I'll ask him. Uh, hello. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, so I have a couple questions and one comment. Um, so a lot of discussion on virtue, and we discussed virtue last month in the meditations as well. So question to you, Dr. Jones, um, do you think Pope also had a Stoic bent or did Stoicism influence him? Uh, because uh, there was a lot of the same concepts that came in. And then maybe if uh, Sheikh Hamza, you could, um, address uh, there's a lot of sort of in our tradition this notion of the balance the middle way the sirat al mustaqim and is there a reading you would recommend on discussing how to balance the virtues uh, uh, from our tradition so those were the two questions and just a comment for future perhaps we discuss the question concerning technology by heidegger sometime because that will address this topic that the last person asked on yeah Thank you, so I, you much. know yeah great great uh, suggestion and um i've kind of thought about you know heidegger's on technology but it's there's a lot of domain knowledge when you get into somebody like heidegger i mean we have we have a wonder annotation but something to think about uh your your response dr jones yeah, just quickly thank you that's a that's a very interesting question as well i think pope is he's read a lot of those classic stoic stoic authors and i think he shares a lot with them um particularly about the ideas of being tested of, of being tried uh, the, the the passage from seneca that i had in my mind as sheikh hamza was, was was talking about the, the different, different kinds of people being a test for one another um seneca saying you know 
God doesn't, um, God's favorite people aren't, aren't let off. It's, it's precisely his favorite people who get all of the sufferings because that's, a, you know, that's, that enables them to show their strengths. So that mm-hmm. sense of, in, I think Pope has that sense of, shares that sense that human life is a state of probation, as, as, as the British said in, in his period of, of time, that we, you're being tested. Um, I think one, one place where Pope is slightly different is that he has a bit more room for what he calls passion or, or self-love. That he thinks um, it's, that, that, that an appropriate human life is not necessarily mastering or living without your passions or your self-love, but seeing which virtues can spring from the, 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 the passions or, or, or one's self-love. So it's, he's, I think he's slightly different. He's, 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 he has a bit more room for um, the way in which I mean, what he calls self-love, which you might call the desire for self-preservation um, uh, or, or the social appetite. I mean, it's, it's difficult to find an equivalent modern expression for, for his use of the word. I think he has more time for those things than the Stoics do. Yeah, great, great um, uh, difference um, because he... Uh... Yeah, he he's definitely much more yes to life, in 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 that way. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, you know there there's a great work uh, if if you're interested the the questioner um, by um, by Nasiruddin Atusi, uh, it's probably one of the finest uh, virtue ethics books written in the Islamic tradition, and it's actually translated a really brilliant translation. Uh, from the Persian. It, it it exists in both Persian and Arabic in our tradition. He originally wrote it in Persian, but there's an excellent Arabic translation that was done about 400 years ago. Um, but but that's probably one of the best um, books that we have on virtue ethics in our tradition. And it's called uh, Nasirian Ethics in English. And I think it's um, the, the, uh, the author, the translator, you know, nobody ever remembers translators, which is one of the great tragedies of being a translator. Um, but uh, the uh, I think it's Wiccans, I think, but it's it's called Nasirian Ethics, N A S I R E A N Ethics. Um, so, next question. Oh, that was actually our last question. Oh, okay, great. Thank you everybody so much. And I really want to especially thank uh, Dr. Jones first and foremost for this extraordinary work that uh, he's given the world, uh, but also just giving us your time uh, and insights and, and uh, clear love of, uh, of this amazing uh, poet philosopher. So thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And I hope one day our cross, uh, our paths cross uh, perhaps in Scotland. I have, I, I th- I think you're, are you English? I am English, yes. Yeah, so, but I, I'm mostly Irish, but I have Chisholm. My my grandmother was a Chisholm uh, from from the Highlands, so. Yeah. Well, th- thank, thank you for, for having me and for sharing your um, knowledge, your, your curiosity and, and wonderful questions. And it's, it's been a very interesting experience for me and has helped me to learn quite a lot about Pope, which I, I didn't know before, so thank you. Okay, great. Well, take care and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Subhanak Allah, alhamdulillah, shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa tuhu ilaik wa al-asri inna l-insana la fi al-khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu sarihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr subhan rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifu wa salamu ala muslim wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.